today. I'm gonna recap first season of 2010 American horror series, called The Walking Dead. The series begins with a car and truck flipped over. A law enforcement vehicle arrives and out comes Rick Grimes. The man in uniform carefully inspects the scene before advancing towards a petrol station. More deserted cars, clothes on lines, dolls, makeshift encampments. A dead female is decomposing in one of the cars. Grimes, who is carrying a can of petrol, is trying to find fuel, but a sign at the station discloses that there is none left. All of a sudden, he spots a staggering form clad in bunny slippers. It is a young girl. Don't be scared, Grimes states. She whirls, a zombie. Grimes draws his firearm and shoots her in the brain. Welcome to the apocalypse. Flashback. Rick and his partner Shane debate the dissimilarities between males and females as they eat their lunch in their cruiser. Rick talks about his wife Lori and son Carl. The couple then gets an emergency call. A car weaving out of control is being pursued by police cars. Rick and his team set up a roadblock. The weaving car swerves and spins multiple times before halting in a nearby field. Two battered men emerge from the wreckage with their guns drawn. They shoot. Rick is hit. The police officers return fire and quickly take out the two men. Rick, who is wearing a bulletproof vest and has just been scratched, assumes it is finished. He gets up and is shot again. It transpires that there is a third gunman in the wrecked car. Shane lifts his shotgun and blasts the man away. He then turns his attention to Rick, who is very hurt. It doesn't look positive. Cut to the hospital. We witness events from Rick's foggy perspective. Shane comes with flowers. Time goes by. But for how long? Later on, Rick regains consciousness. The flowers are wilted. The clock has stopped ticking. Rick manages to stagger into the hallway and finds a chaotic scene. Gurneys, documents and machines are all over the place. Rick is shocked to find a hospital employee lying dead on the floor, and it appears they have been nearly consumed. Additionally, a set of double doors have been chained up with a warning scrawled on them that reads, Don't open, dead inside. Knowing it is best to stay away, Rick retreats to a pitch black room with a staircase that goes down. With merely a match to light his path, he manages to locate an exit door and is suddenly exposed to the daylight. Outside, he's appalled to see countless decomposing corpses wrapped in hospital sheets. Rick scrambles away from the hospital, unearths a bicycle, and hauls it back home. He shouts Lori and Carl, but the house is deserted. Sobbing, Rick exits the house. Something is coming up behind him, slowly. It's a non-zombie kid. The little boy, Dwayne, swings a spade and knocks Rick to the ground. His father, Morgan, quickly appears and sees that Rick isn't a zombie, after all. Rick faints from the head. For the second time that day, Rick found himself in an unfamiliar bed, tethered to it. Were you bitten? Were scratched? Morgan inquired. Rick replied that he had only been shot. But three of them then sat down for dinner and Morgan told them that the streets were filled with walkers. He went on to explain that the process began with a bite leading to death, then a fever that burns you out and eventually after a while, you come back. Dwayne peered out the window at the walking dead and spotted his mother. He sobbed, and Morgan tried his best to console him. Morgan says, I ought to have ended her. I just didn't have the strength. Rick came back to his home the following day, carrying Morgan and Dwayne. He saw that the picture albums of his family were all absent. Rick assumed that his family had left after collecting their possessions. Dwayne suggested they may have journeyed to Atlanta, where the CDC is based. The trio then head to the police station to get hot showers and to get hold of arms and ammunition. Rick bids farewell to Morgan and Dwayne, who take their equipment to a jeep close by. Rick stays just long enough to fire a zombie cop he was acquainted with before speeding away in his police car headed for Atlanta. Meanwhile, Morgan and Dwayne make their way back home. Dad instructs his son to stay downstairs and Morgan goes up to the bedroom. He takes aim at the undead in the street with a rifle that has a scope. He shoots too, before recognizing his wife. Morgan trembles as he takes aim, but he can't bring himself to fire the gun. Zombie mom slowly moves away. Morgan breaks down into tears. Rick utilizes his police radio to ascertain if there is any response. Not knowing that a group of survivors did hear his message, but they couldn't hear his answer. It turns out that the camp, located in a field, is occupied by Shane, Lori, and Carl. Lori proposes that they should have designated a sign on the roadside to alert people about the zombie-filled Atlanta being hazardous. Shane says that they don't have the time for that. She marches off to a tent. Shane enters to attempt to calm her down. And the result of the conversation is a passionate kiss. Rick finds himself at a farmhouse with inhabitants who opted to take their own lives rather than live in a zombie-ridden world. He is in search of fuel when he sees a horse in the yard, so he abandons his vehicle and mounts the steed. Rick's journey takes him closer to Atlanta and he finds it void of people, aside from wrecked cars, abandoned army helicopters, and destroyed buses. Zombies start to show up and it's then that he realizes he's in a world of trouble. Suddenly, Rick perceives the noise of a helicopter. He urges the horse to pursue it, and turns a corner into a side street loaded with zombies. Rapidly turning around, Rick retreats and runs into another swarm. The sheriff is dragged from his horse, which swiftly becomes zombie food. Rick then wriggles underneath an army tank and starts blasting wildly. 
He then notices a hatch in the bottom of the tank and drags himself into the innards of the steel beast, banging the hatch shut behind him. He scurries up against a seemingly lifeless soldier and takes his gun. While gazing away, the soldier comes to zombie life, Rick shoots him in the head just in time. Now, we gotta go to a familiar survivor camp. Lori says she's off and orders Carl to stay near Dale, saying if you spot anything, give a yell and I'll come running. She then sets off into the woods to get supplies and hears a noise but finds nothing. When she hears another noise, she's about to get worried until Shane comes up all of a sudden and drags her down to the ground. Without delay, they start to undress. When Shane catches sight of Lori's pendant, he stops for a moment, she takes it off, and they start making passionate love in the grass once more. In Atlanta, Lori's husband, Sheriff Rick, is stuck in a tank surrounded by zombies. Although they cannot get inside, a voice is coming from the radio. Are you still alive in there? It asks. The voice then mentions a side street with fewer walkers and suggests that Rick makes a break for it. Taking some deep breaths, Rick leaves the tank and bashes a zombie in the face, shoots a few others, and takes off running. Unexpectedly, a young man appears and directs Rick down an alley. The pair ascend a fire escape, and the guy with the voice on the radio identifies himself as Glenn. They ascend to the rooftop and then return through the building to the street. With zombies in pursuit, Rick and Glenn manage to make it to a department store, where a group of survivors are waiting. One of the survivors, Andrea, is angry at Rick for shooting his gun and bringing the undead. Indeed, a flock of zombies have congregated at the entryway of the store. Soon, the group hears gunfire. They dash to the roof and see Merle firing his gun. T-Dog, who is African-American, reproaches Merle for wasting bullets, and the two immediately come to blows. It culminates with Merle pointing a firearm at T-Dog and proclaiming his superiority. Anybody else? The bigoted individual inquires. Rick says yes, and wallops Merle in the face with a rifle. Rick then ties Merle to a pipe, before flinging the keys off the roof. Rick later proposes that they all go to the sewers. Jackie, who used to work in the city zoning department, mentions that the building should have an access point in the basement. Glenn offers to go down the hole to assess the circumstances, and takes Morales and a flashlight with him. Meanwhile, T-Dog and Merle exchange barbs on the roof as the former tries to get in touch with someone on the radio. Glenn and Morales come back from their time in the sewer, informing that a steel grate makes the sewer impossible to leave by. Even worse, the zombies have made it through the first set of glass doors. The only thing that is keeping them from coming into the department store is the final set of doors. So what should they do? Rick proposes making a distraction. Andrea mentions that the undead can differentiate the smell of the living. It's apparently unmistakable. Chop up a security guard's corpse, coat ourselves in his blood and guts, and smell like zombies as horrible as it sounds, they get it done with a hefty axe and protective gloves. He then gives T-Dog a key to unlock Merle's cuffs and he and Glenn step outside. Incredibly, the two merge, passing the zombies who take a whiff of them and then turn their zombie gaze elsewhere. The other survivors observe from the rooftop. Sadly, the sky is filling with dark clouds. It's going to rain, and maybe even wash clean Rick and Glenn. Rick and Glenn keep walking through the throng of zombies when it starts raining. The viscera starts to be washed away from the twosome. The zombies start to whiff something. A zombie lunges, and Rick drives his axe into the creature's noggin, eventually leaping over a chain-link fence. As the zombies figure out how to climb the fence, Rick and Glenn race to an automobile at a construction area. The keys have been left inside. They start up the motor and speed away. They don't make it far. Rick soon brings the truck to a halt and breaks into a nearby sports car, setting off its loud alarm. The plan, Glenn will take the sports car to the entrance of the department store and the alarm will draw the zombies. Meanwhile, Rick will drive the truck to the back of the store and collect the survivors. Glenn radios the group with the details. T-Dog releases Merle with the key. Unfortunately, T-Dog trips and the key flies from his hand and falls into an open pipe. I'm so sorry. A horrified T-Dog shouts before running away from the rooftop. Cut to Glenn, who plows through a throng of walkers in front of the department store, the car alarm wailing the entire time. Cut to Rick, who backs up to a loading dock. Morales, Jackie, T-Dog and Andrea hop into the back of the truck. Rick realizes Merle isn't there. T-Dog explains what happened. Cut to Glenn, who hurtles down an uninhabited highway in the sports car. He emits a victorious scream. Merle, still attached to a rooftop in Atlanta, rants and raves almost incomprehensibly. It seems like he is talking about his period in the armed forces. After some moments, he appears to come to at the sound of zombies pounding on the door to the roof. Cut to Rick and Morales ride through a town, the pass conveying that unfortunate Merle has a brother called Darrow. Cut to the makeshift camp where Lori cuts Carl's hair while Shane watches. Shane vows to teach Carl how to catch frogs. We'll provide these people Cajun-style Kermit legs, promises unexpected father figure Shane. Out of the blue, Glenn drives up in his sports car, trailed by Rick, Morales and the rest of the survivors. Come meet everybody, Morales tells the sheriff. Andrea is united with Amy. Morales is reunited with his family. And, in the end, Rick sees Lori and Carl. They hug. After being reunited with great emotion, 
A fact that Shane watches with perplexity and shock, Rick snuggles up to his wife and son by the campfire. He tells Shane how appreciative he is, not knowing that the two have become more than just friends. T-Dog contemplates if Merle is still alive, feeling that the lock on the rooftop door is too powerful for the walkers to break through. Everyone in the camp is also apprehensive to tell Daro, who is away on a hunt, as they expect his reaction to be quite negative. Later, Rick and Lori are in the family tent and she says, Baby, I truly thought I would never see you again. I'm so sorry. For everything. But she cannot bring herself to disclose the particulars of her involvement with Shane. Afterwards, Rick passionately kisses his wife, and after some hesitation, she responds in kind. Shane, at the same time, sits alone. The following morning, Rick is making his way through the camp when he hears a scream. Carl has spotted a zombie devouring a dead deer. Rick, Shane, Dale and Glenn come up to the creature and beat it to death, Dale eventually decapitating it. At that moment, Daryl came back to camp, furious at the zombie for eating the deer he had shot. He took his revenge with his crossbow, and Andrea and Amy winced. Shane then informed Daryl of the bad news, Merle had not returned from Atlanta. Rick proceeded to tell him that he had handcuffed Merle to the roof, and was still there. Daryl became apoplectic and attacked Rick, who was subdued by Shane with assistance. T-Dog explained that he had dropped the key down a drain. Rick announced his intention of going back, and Lori hung her head. Shane tried to dissuade Rick from going, especially to save someone like Merle. Rick declared that he could not let a man die, as they had left him like an animal in a trap. Daryl and T-Dog volunteered, as did Glenn reluctantly. Rick remarked that it was not only about rescuing Merle, but also retrieving a bag containing guns, ammunition, and a walkie-talkie, which could be used to warn Morgan and his son Dwayne from going to Atlanta. After they left, Lori comforted Carl, whose assurance ended up being comforting for her. Sometime later, Shane and Carl form a bond by trying to catch frogs. Jackie ponders why the women have been relegated to doing the laundry. They then list things that they miss from their former lives. Andrea states that she misses her vibrator, causing the ladies to erupt in laughter. However, when Ed, Carol's temperamental husband, shows up, their smiles quickly fade. He admonishes his fearful wife, saying that this isn't a comedy club. Lori then reprimands Carl for leaving Dale in the care of Shane. After Carl is gone, Lori turns her ire on Shane, telling him to stay away from her and her son, as her husband is now alive. Shane is distressed. Meanwhile, Rick, Daryl, Glenn, and T-Dog park their truck outside Atlanta and choose to enter the city on foot. Soon, the four of them are inside a department store. Daryl shoots a zombie in the brain with an arrow. Back at the camp, Ed's anger has increased. He insults Andrea and then slaps Carol across the face. Shane, who is already enraged, charges at Ed and begins to beat him mercilessly. That is a bloody mess before Shane stops, warning the wife beater that if he ever strikes anyone in the camp again, he will die. Carol shrieks and runs to her badly injured husband. Ultimately, the Atlanta group ascend to the rooftop to discover Merle gone, or at least part of him. It's obvious that Merle was able to lay his hands on the saw. His severed hand is still on the roof, but the rest of Darl's elder sibling appears to have made off. Darl is livid and points his crossbow at T-Dog, blaming him for the situation. Rick, in turn, trains his gun on Darl, ordering him to back off. The tension lowers and Darl takes hold of his brother's hand, wrapping it in T-Dog's bandana. The team continues on to follow Merle's blood trail and find a few dead zombies in their path. It appears Merle still knows how to take down the undead, even without a full set of hands. Meanwhile, Glenn was outlining a strategy for the rescue mission. The team advances onto the sidewalks, which are swarming with pedestrians. Glenn manages to snatch up the bag of weapons that Rick left behind, but is then ambushed by living members of a street gang. The gangsters thrust Glenn into their car and speed off. One of the gang, however, is stranded, and the youngster is right away surrounded by T-Dog and a wrathful Daro. They interrogates the apprehended delinquent, who declines to supply any information. Daryl then displays the punk Merle's amputated hand, asserting that it was he who did the chopping. The punk quivers in terror, and then talks. Soon after, the rescue team gets to the den of the gang, headed by a man called Guillermo. Rick suggests bargaining Glenn for the juvenile punk, but Guillermo turns down the offer. He desires the bag of firearms. Only then will the gang yield Glenn. The rescue squad withdraws to their makeshift base, where the guns are stashed. Not surprisingly, Daryl doesn't want to part with the guns. Yet Rick has a different opinion. The sheriff explains that Glenn saved him from within a tank. Rick intends to pay him back. Hence, soon after, the team reaches the gang hideout for the second time. The young punk is manacled and silenced as he is forced in at gunpoint where he is then set free. Rick declared, refusing to part with the bag of weapons. Pistols were pulled and aimed when an elderly woman split the gathering. She was the grandmother of one of the gang participants. Rick reassured the abuela that he hadn't come to capture her grandchild. The old lady then led Rick and the rescuers into an adjoining old folks' home. It transpired that the group was looking after the inhabitants and were ready to fight for firearms and medicine to do so. Guillermo, a custodian at the facility, explained, the staff cut out. They just abandoned these people here to die. The gang served as protection, compassionately, 
Rick presented a few weapons to sustain the effort. The rescue team goes back to their van, only to find it missing. Glenn inquires, who would take it? Rick answers, Merle, to which even Darrell shows his disapproval. So, they start their journey to the camp on foot. Cut to the makeshift camp, they are all having a good time until zombies come and attack the camp. Ed is bitten, and another walker takes a bit out of Amy's neck. Andrea cries out in horror as her sister bleeds out. Everyone fights back while Shane shoots at the zombies, Morales and Jim using bats. Just then, the rescue team comes to the rescue. They fire their weapons as zombie brains splatter the campsite. At last, all is silent, except for Andrea's screams of grief as she kneels over her sister's dead body. The rest of the survivors look on in shock. Rick is adamant that Atlanta belongs to the dead and that Morgan should not enter the city. He informs the survivors of the situation and gives them the location of the survivors. Andrea continues to grieve for Amy, who lies dead on the campground. Lori speaks up, expressing that all of them cared about her and that they should dispose of her body in a gentle manner. Darrell angrily confronts Glenn, reminding him that he left his brother for dead and that he had it coming. Jim was bitten in the skirmish and hides it, but Jackie announces it to the camp. Darrell suggests putting a pickaxe into Jim's head, but Rick insists that they don't kill the living. He suggests they head to the CDC in hopes of finding a cure. Rick firmly states that Morgan should not enter Atlanta because it belongs to the dead. He tells the survivors where the other survivors are before Andrea grieves for Amy. Later, Dale and Andrea had a candid talk. Following the death of his wife from cancer, he felt nothing for anyone until Andrea and Amy came along. Andrea was moved. She placed Amy's birthday present, a necklace and pendant, on the deceased woman's wound-covered neck. In the meantime, Carol decided to plunge a pickaxe into the skull of her husband. She completed the act repeatedly, likely trying to release some of her past anger. At the same time, Shane is skeptical of Rick's plan to go and find Merle. He's concerned that a power struggle between them may be beginning. But there's no time for that. Everyone gathers to lay their deceased comrade to rest, despite Darrell's protest. Rick then makes a solemn promise to his son, I'll never leave again. Not for any reason. Lori questions the wisdom of going to the CDC based on a hunch. But with poor Jim getting worse, a decision needs to be made quickly. In the end, Lori sides with Rick, telling Shane they should heed his gut. Shane isn't pleased with her decision. I gotta do what's best for my fam. Rick and Shane strike out into the woods to look for zombies, bickering about the best way to go about it. Shane's obviously angry, but he don't say why. They separate in the hunt for the walking dead. From a distance, Shane points a gun at Rick, yet he doesn't shoot. Flashback. Shane hastens through the disordered hospital, pleading for assistance. Military forces fire on a collection of medical personnel and nurses. Zombies abruptly show up and take a bite out of the military. Shane ducks into a chamber where Rick is in a deep sleep. If you're gonna rouse yourself, you better do it quick. Shane instructs his pal. It doesn't work. Rick continues to doze off so Shane reluctantly goes away, shutting the door to Rick's room before he does so. The next morn, Rick tries Morgan on the radio once more, telling him his plan to get to the CDC. Again, Morgan don't respond. Shane then explains the details of the caravan when Morales informs them he won't be joining. Rather, the survivor and his family are gonna go to Alabama, where they have family. Everybody except the Morales family piled into cars, trucks and the camper, then drove away. Jim was moaning from the pain in the back of the RV. Not surprisingly, they hadn't gone far before the camper overheated. Shane stepped up and said he'd ride on ahead to a gas station to see if he could find a replacement part. When Rick went to check on Jim, he asked to be left to die. The group then lifted Jim up to a nearby tree. Rick offered him a gun, but the ailing man refused it. After that, Jim was left alone in the wilderness. Next, a flickering video feed appears. A man introduces himself as Jenner and takes a sip from a CDC mug. Underground, he's been trying to find a cure with no success. Then the transmission ends. Jenner, wearing a full protective get-up, examines portions of the dead body and hears classical music. Visibly drained, he carelessly knocks over a test tube and alarms start to blare. He quickly bolts to the door and it shuts behind him. The lab room is then engulfed in flames. A robotic voice proclaims that cleansing is finished. Jenner hangs his head in disappointment. His new samples have been obliterated. No more experiments, still no remedy. Later on, Jenner imbibes Vino. I reckon I'm gonna end it all tomorrow, he utters into a monitor. But for now, I'm gonna get wasted. The camera moves away to expose that Jenner is all by himself in a spacious and advanced subterranean site. Surrounding the CDC is a landscape of cadavers, hundreds of them. The group of scared survivors makes their way through the bodies to the entrance. Inside, Jenner catches sight of the survivors on a surveillance monitor. He is stunned. Rick looks straight into the camera and pleads for assistance. Jenner pauses, battling with how to reply to the survivor's petition, and then eventually unlocks the entrance from inside. But then Dr. Jenner appears from a shadowy corner, inquiring, is anyone sick? He insists they all get a blood test as the price of entry. Rick complies. Jenner then brings them down below, telling them the other doctors have passed away or gone away. He has only had a computer with a female voice as his companion. 
Afterward, the party indulges in some drinks of wine before Jenner shows them their rooms, which include hot water. Everybody indulges in a hot shower and imbibes, even though it's manifest that Andrea is not in the best of health. She throws up in the loo and cries. Dale tends to perceive the end of the world as a fresh start but Andrea isn't convinced by his words. Rick, inebriated, has an intimate conversation with Jenner. To put it simply, the sheriff admits that the group had no real opportunity of making it in the outside world. Everything will be alright, Jenner tells him without much conviction. Shane, in his inebriated state, approaches Lori and speaks in a confrontational manner, explaining that a massacre happened at the hospital, leaving him no other option but to leave Rick. It takes a dark turn when Shane declares his love for Lori and begins to grope her. She pushes him away, leaving a scratch on his neck. He leaves in shame and fury while Lori tries to regain her composure. On the following morning, T-Dog prepared some powdered eggs for the survivors. Shane entered, attempting to hide the scratches on his neck, offering a flimsy explanation that he had inflicted them himself. After breakfast, Jenner asked the computer to run the video of TS-19, which referred to the experiment of Test Subject 19, a person who had been bitten by a zombie and was monitored throughout the process. The group watched as the subject's brain neurons deteriorated and then suddenly came back to life during the resurrection. Jenner explained that the human part of the brain, the neocortex, would not be revived and that nothing was left but an empty shell, driven by instinct. It was clear that Jenner knew nothing more, and was far from finding a cure. The video ended with a bullet piercing the brain stem, ceasing all neurological activity. Dale then spots a countdown timer. Jenner reveals that the basement generator will soon be out of fuel. He states that nothing good will happen when this occurs. Rick organizes a group to investigate the generators located in the basement. On inspection, they find an array of empty fuel drums. Immediately after this, the air conditioning system ceases. Jenner, in the meanwhile, has tidied himself up with a shave, combed his hair and even put on a tie. He is looking at a framed portrait of his late wife when the lights go out. The CDC is starting to power down. There is only 30 minutes left on the clock. Jenner goes on to explain that the French were the last to attempt to find a cure. He comments that they believed they were on the brink of a solution, but eventually their energy ran out in the same way as it is now. Rick is in a frenzy, ordering the group to get their bags ready to leave. But Jenner seals the door, preventing any escape. He points out that it would be futile, as the computer has blocked off all of the exits at the ground level. He explains that the facility is equipped with many dangerous viruses and will automatically self-destruct once power is cut, killing everyone inside. Jenner calmly remarks, it's better this way. This way, there'll be no pain. With that, he has accepted his fate that he will die in half an hour. Shane and Darrell make a failed attempt to break through the door with axes. Jenner's response is, it's hopeless, this is our end of days. But Shane is not going to accept defeat without a struggle and starts firing his shotgun. Rick overpowers him, takes away the gun and throws Shane to the floor. After a moment of quiet, Rick confronts Jenner about hiding the truth. Jenner then confesses that TS-19 was his wife and she was running the laboratory. Rick argues, we just want a choice. Jenner opens the sealed door, cautioning the survivors that the upper exits remain sealed. He tells Rick there's her chance, take it, and holds out his hand to shake Rick's, also uttering something in his ear. I will say it in the first comment. While Jackie and Andrea opt to stay and accept certain death, Dale urges them otherwise, saying this isn't what Amy would want for you. The rest of the survivors have run to the front lobby, attempting to shatter the glass with no success, even with a shotgun blast. Carol then takes out a grenade from her purse, which Rick takes and places against the window. He releases the pin, and the glass breaks and a way out is provided. Dale and Andrea have made the decision to stay alive, so they walk out of the building they had been in. As they do, a noise of time running out can be heard, and the survivors take cover as the CDC building is obliterated. Afterward, a thick cloud of smoke is visible in the sky as the team drives away. If you liked the video, please press the like button to encourage us to make more recaps.